Welcome everyone to the December 12, 2023 Penfield Parks and Recreation Advisory Board meeting. I'm Don Hoyler, the vice chairperson for this board. Uh, Shri Kartek is the vice is the chair and she's unable to attend tonight. So I will be leading the meeting. Uh, everyone in the room has an agenda, so we'll get started um, with a uh, question if anyone has any additions or deletions to the agenda. Looking around, I see none. Um, next would be the approval of the minutes from the November 14th, 2023 meeting. Does anyone have any comments or should we move to approve? That's good. All in favor? All right. Well, those minutes will be accepted. So we'll start with um, discussions. Uh, we'll go a little bit out of order tonight because we have a couple presentations. So we'll start um, with the Eagle Scout projects under the Penfield Parks uh, discussion points. And so Marco Costanzo is in the room with us. And Marco did a, an Eagle Scout project that he has completed. And I think you're going to uh, let us know how that went, Marco? Yep. All right, go ahead, thank you. So hi everyone, I'm Marco Costanzo. I'm here with Troop 312. Hear me all right? Uh, I was originally here back in June to share with my proposal originally for several display cases for the various tennis courts in Penfield, to schedules, whatnot. Um, I'm here to give you tonight an update on my now completed project. Go on. So here I uh, have my PowerPoint open, project overview. So the, it was a leadership project, lead Boy Scouts through the process of building, delivering, and installing display cases at Penfield Tennis Courts, which was Greenwood, Fenner's Memorial, and here's Wayland Park. It was predominantly made out of Azek Composites, who has officially donated to me. Um, go to the next one. So over the summer, I have I acquired the donated materials from Palmer Shapes and Lair Plastics, as well as the ASEC from being a wholesale using a haul truck, you haul truck. The build strategy was to build one fully assembled case as, as sort of a prototype to demonstrate to the scouts. And the other two would be sort of kits for the scouts to actually assemble. And during the process, uh, many power tools uh, have been used to uh, uh, make the kits, but with the scouts, BSA guidelines prohibits any scouts from using a power tool other than a cordless drill. So the kits, were to, were to be able for the scouts to build it with just simple tools. Here I'm, uh, so the process uh, of building case one, uh, squaring it, drilling it together, cutting the various pieces. And here I have uh, several scouts with me, leading them through the assembly process. Uh, by gluing, inserting screws, make sure that they are square, installing the doors, installing the roof, again with simple tools, no crazy power tools, and uh, an extension of uh, leading the scouts through more installation as well as the mounting hardware to properly put them on the tennis courts. And this is the results. It, wow. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, there's still another slide. And I th it's uh, me with some of the scouts. Uh, I think it turned out very nicely. A lot of hard work was put into it. Uh, almost 200 hours were put into this project. What with uh, paperwork, what with uh, assembly, what with leading through the scout, which was the big one. This is one of them at Harris. Very nice. And of course, uh, these were built to last a long time. Uh, I made sure to take extra measures to increase the durability, such as rabbit joints for the door frames to sort of strengthen it, 
as well as using longer screws, um, as well as using machine screws to uh, counteract the natural strain of the door so the doors can uh, keep going. Uh, and uh, some screws to bite more in the case intact. And for the security, on the back there are two eye bolts for double locking on the back as well as a hasp in the front to you know, give a little bit of security, make sure nothing crazy happens to it. And yeah. Well, awesome. well done. Great Excellent. job. Thank yeah. you. Again, thank you for having me. How did, um, how did it turn out budget-wise? I know you saved a lot of money getting those donations for the AZAC. Right. Uh, I don't exactly know the, I don't know, off the top of my head, uh, the full out-of-pocket price, but uh, if this were all out-of-pocket, it would come to around almost $2,000 for this project. But thankfully, uh, several companies have so graciously donated the products to me and has lowered the price insanely. Nice. So that was pretty creative using the power tools to make the kits so you could get others. Thank you. What did you uh, learn most, would you say, personally, from doing this, leading this project? Hmm. I would say patience. Nothing can be rushed. Uh, take your time with it. Nothing too insane. You could tell the high quality, well planned. I like the whole idea of the building the prototype and then making the kits for the other scouts to assemble. Very smart. Thank you. Yeah. Want to make sure that this was as simple as possible for the scouts. Yeah, and I know um, you know when we first met with Marco and we looked at different projects around. This was one of our ones at the top of the list, and because it's a more of a display at our tennis courts that um, have become more and more popular and people can reserve, uh, whether it be for recreation programs or, or, or other things and events, you know, this was a huge need for the community, um, you know, with pickleball growing as a sport and, and, and tennis being out there in order to say when courts are reserved, but also to, uh, to show rules out there. So, you know, we, we originally said, oh, you know, one case would be appropriate and for Marco to come in and, and do three of them was uh, just way beyond the scope of what the town you know wanted and expected so you know <clears throat> kudos this was a wonderful project and going above and beyond so I uh, can't thank you enough uh, for the community also and for the rec department since I'm the one that's usually you know tagging the the pieces of paper to the tennis court uh, lines and stuff this is gonna be a huge help for for everybody so thank you well thank you for having me and thank you for giving me the chance the challenge to build these cases mm -hmm. Yep, and if anybody does go out there, um, because our tennis courts go offline, um, kind of in the off season, we usually look around early November, pending on weather and things like that. But because we've shut down our tennis and pickleball courts for the season, um, we've actually take, taken the uh, display cases and put them in storage. So uh, you won't see these until spring, which is usually around April when the uh, weather gets nicer. So uh, we're looking forward to having out there and filling them with great information and stuff so thank you any other questions from from the group great job awesome. thank, thank you, Marco. you very good thank job. you very good job thank, thank you. you thank you thank you awesome all right uh, so moving on the next um, Adam okay so we have Adam Wrights here from further trail services and Adam's been working on a mountain bike trail project uh, since the inception of Shadow Pines there's been interest in putting a mountain bike trail in that, the, particularly on the, the south side in the hillier portions in the back. Um, I know some people would like it to see, <laughs> like to see it bigger than, than that, but uh, either way, Adam's here and you're gonna tell us, I guess, uh, what you've come up with so far for a, what, is this a notional draft plan or I'm not sure what we're gonna yeah, see. So here. this is basically gonna detail the process as we go, as we navigate through it. Okay. So uh, the contract was just signed recently mm -hmm. and we've acquired GIS data from the town and we're also acquiring data from public sources as well. 
uh, we've put together the the proposal and that was signed and so we're moving forward with um, some initial conceptual work by analyzing that GIS data and then we're also um, sort of navigating the planning documents as they've been written so far, the current master plan, and then a okay. number of other documents that are out there. So this will do a pretty good job at, at uh, drawing the roadmap for the work that we're going to do together. Sounds good. All right. So um, so anyway, yeah, my name is Adam Wrights. I'm the owner and principal of Further Trail Services. And Further is primarily a trail construction company. But we also do professional services in the form of planning and design work specifically focused on shared use and mountain bike optimized trail systems. Um, further helps facilitate the development of community focused and destination worthy trails. Uh, it's important to highlight because, you know, the emphasis is on making sure that the local community has the infrastructure that they need to thrive, but also that the, the product that we create together is as high quality as, as desirable and um, you know that high quality product makes the amenities and the infrastructure more desirable to come visit and to come live near. So next slide. Um, so we work for the conservation and enjoyment of natural resources through the sustainable development of trail based recreation that enriches lives. So you know sustainability can really be thought of in a threefold way. There's the environmental sustainability that most people think about, uh, particularly with regard to trails, but there's also the social and economic sustainability of what we're endeavoring to create. So it's important that these trails, by design, help reduce conflict, that they are, as I was suggesting, as desirable as possible to visit and use and enjoy. Um, that social sustainability helps justify expense and helps justify maintenance. Um, it helps justify further development if um, it inspires others to follow suit. And it's really important that from a user-based perspective that people really get out of it what they hope to get out of it when they come visit those trails. So uh, my background personally is in local advocacy. I was an officer with Grok before I decided to become a professional trails person. Uh, my educational background is in industrial design, so using a similar product design focused methodology, we'll be using that here as well. Um, and my bachelor or my master's is in recreation and leisure management from Brockport, so I'm a, I'm a rec guy too. Um, so the the two worlds unite as product for play, basically. So it's it's just linear format recreation is what we're trying to offer the people. I'm a former consultant and contractor with the International Mountain Bicycling Association. I've got years of experience working with IMBA uh, as a professional and have done trail projects, both planning, design, and construction in 10 different states, mostly in the southeast, but also out in Utah. Um, further was started specifically about a year ago now in order to increase the local capacity for this type of work because there is a need to bridge that gap between the volunteer world and what um, conventional landscape architects and engineers mm -hmm. as consultants can offer the, the recreation world. So this is a, uh, going to be a very analogous process to what you've been through with the master planning process in terms of its form. And um, yeah, further was started to just focus specifically in this area although trails can be very diverse as, as mm -hmm. what you'll see moving forward. So the project understanding, um, and you've all read the proposal, correct? Um, mm -hmm. So some of this will be a little bit of a rehash, but um, so the town of Penfield seeks to develop a written plan and graphical maps depicting the potential for natural surface trail infrastructure at Shadow Pines. Again, it's a written plan with graphical assets, very similar to the master planning process that you've already gone through for the park in a more comprehensive way. The plan will formalize the vision and goals. It's going to communicate the needs and benefits. It's going to illustrate the project potential. It's going to allow for informed decision making. So from the recommendations, you, you know, you get to pick and choose, and then it'll support approvals and fundraising. So if there are asks that need to be made, this will help advance those. So a little bit of trail theory, this is important stuff to kind of get into. 
So why trails? One, it was recommended by the consultant. You know, BME did a great job with the master plan. And there was also expressed community desire. So, um, you know, those two things paired well um, are powerful, and, and that's kind of what got us to a more granular place in that planning process. Um, and trails are particularly great because they're cost effective. When you think about other amenities like ball fields and, and um, building structures and that sort of stuff, trails come in you know, pretty mm -hmm. quietly. But they can also be relatively audacious in terms of their scope from what you'll see a little deeper into the presentation. So, you know, they're cost effective, they're great land management strategies. Uh, traditionally, trails are great because they preserve land from development. I mean, this isn't a park space, but if there are other opportunities down the line for things that, uh, parcels that could come online, you know, trails can be a great low impact way of preserving green space. Uh, they support diverse users. You know, what you'll see a little bit deeper into the presentation is is they trails can take many forms to serve many different types of users, but also different types of sub-users. Uh, they promote health and wellness. Uh, they stimulate economic vitality from tourism, but also making your community a better place to be. And they just strengthen communities in general. So what do users want, particularly trail users? You got all these different people here. They want experiences. Next one. So some people, you know, everybody's looking for something a little bit different. Some people want something really rocky, rocky rugged. They want some sort of challenge. Some people want to get away. You know, they want to unplug from their computers and they want to kind of get as far away from the day to day and get away from their problems and unplug and next one. Some people like to play, you know, so there are trails, certain format trails that can encourage interpretation and progression. Next one. Some people want to do something scary <laughs> and make it to the other side. So, mm -hmm. you know, as with a lot of adventure based recreation, you know, there's a certain measure of risk that people um, endeavor to conquer. Next one. So, as I've said, a lot of different users and a lot of diverse objectives for why people are out there. And experience based design, which is what we focus on with, in the trail world, it seeks to identify all the different reasons why people are out there and how can we support them, you know? So whatever their experience objectives are, there's a, likely there's a type of trail that's gonna fit those needs. And so even though we're talking about mountain biking or shared use trails and mountain biking in more of a blanketed way, you know, people might be out there um, for adventure our friends with disabilities may need access, you know, or people in general just need access to wooded spaces as we've seen over at Shadow Pines that don't have trails currently. Is there a way that we can offer access, whether it be more primitive or more developed, in order that people can enjoy those spaces? Um, some people are looking to engage with nature. Some people are looking for solitude, on and on. Uh, the last one, uh, last two, socializing and learning. You know, trails, and particularly trail hubs, we talked about this during one of the site walks, they're great because they're good social centers. And then if we do this correctly, um, if we make recommendations that are implemented that um, foster learning, you know, these, these facilities can be great um, skill builders for people. Mm -hmm. So, but the bottom line is everybody that's out there is looking for some form of optimal experience. And that means that, you know, mountain bikers often talk about something called flow. You know, they're talking about flowy trails and getting into the flow. And, and flow is more than a type of trail. Uh, in the industry, the type of flow trail is generally um, uh, constructed to have rollers and berms, which are waves of dirt and things like that. But flow is more than that. It's actually, uh, you know, from the rec world, Dr. C, um, it's a state of mind. And trails, unlike many other types of recreation, offer what's called a flow state, which is a synchronistic state where the challenge that you're endeavoring to conquer 
correlates perfectly with the ch with your ability. So as the challenge gets harder and your ability rises in a corresponding way, you, you have a synchronistic state. And that, you know, for a lot of people, that's really powerful. So as recreation providers, you know, we have this incredible ability to offer that to people. And if we plan this thing right and offer it in a diverse way that, that helps maximize the diversity of the experiences while reducing user conflict or inter-user conflict, you know, we can, we can create something great. So, you know, everything from our emerging riders, our newest <laughs> riders, up to the hardcore riders, you know, everybody is seeking that experience uh, in its many forms. So, so trail types, you know, we've got pathways and roads, and for, let's say, foot traffic, you know, uh, the uh, pathways and roads, that's okay, can be, um, can be great because people can walk side by side. It promotes the social stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. All forms of trails are valid. You ask people to close their eyes and envision a trail in their mind, and likely they're going to think of something that resonates with them the most, right? But for different types of users, you know, it's important to promote that trail diversity by offering what we can. And, and in a restricted... Um, amount of space. We're going to be limited in our options, but but from what I've seen of the site so far and the few site walks that we've done, you know, you've got some nice stands of wood. You've mm -hmm. got some rolling terrain. You know, um, you've got some graded terrain, and all of that's ideal for a number of different things. So bike optimized single track. You notice the difference between the traditional single track that looks more like an old hiking trail. And this one that has berm turns in it. So it's more of a surfy kind of vibe. And bike optimized can also be rocky. Gravity trails are, are um, fed. The inertia is harnessed from starting at the top and descending to the bottom. That gets you a gravity trail experience. And then there's bike parks. So bike parks are often constructed using pre-engineered, off-the-shelf kind of features or installed professionally. And you can come up with more of a, a playground-like atmosphere with a wheeled context, right? So your next one. Mm -hmm. so, so there's that implementation of bike parks. There's this one. This is an asphalt pump track. I'm sure you've, you've heard requests for an asphalt pump track. Um, now, these aren't cheap. You know, we're getting into kind of the audacious terrain. And there are going to be some recommendations that our local advocacy and stewardship organization can help with, and there are going to be some that may require even more engineering and design work from specialists that specialize in this type of work. So next one. So this one is, this is the rail yard in Bentonville, Arkansas. You can see the, the complementary engineering that went into this one. This wasn't just volunteers out there with hand tools. This was um, a full site plan specifically for the experiences that they were attempting to curate here. This, due to sustainability um, issues, has now been paved over. The whole thing was <laughs> paved over. So, you know, there are um, emerging technologies in this, in the trails world, and the ecosystem of trails that is highly scalable, right? You can do anything from locally stick built things and trails built with hand tools all the way up to multi-million dollar extremely audacious projects and they have to you know the the tolerance for doing these types of things goes back to the community's appetite and the, the town's desire to put it out there right so in Parenton right now they've worked with some consultants and they've got a a wheeled play park that they're developing. I'm sure you've probably seen the concept plans for that. Uh, it's focused primarily on skateboards and inline skates and things, but it's also going to allow for some larger wheeled play as well. But um, yeah, extremely audacious, but you know, we'll find the recommendations that seem to fit the, uh, the community need and the appetite. So next one. All right, so our project approach, as you've seen in the uh, proposal, it's a collaborative process of assessment. We're going to be taking a look at the existing conditions, um, the terrain, the 
current market and what's available here currently because we're going to be endeavoring to offer some new things that, that aren't currently offered in the existing parks and trail networks. Um, there's going to be an, a process of planning work and then also design work that is in partnership with the town and the local stakeholders. So, you know, we are in task one and this is somewhat of a linear process defining the tasks. The tasks more outline the scope of work that we're going to be doing, but right now we're in the project um, preparation task primarily, and that's figuring out the goals, you know, looking at the objectives in the area of interest and uh, starting to get our bearings. We're reviewing mapping data, as I uh, said earlier, and looking at the different planning documents that are available to make sure that our recommendations are in line with recommendations that have come prior. And then we're creating base maps currently in GIS, and those are going to be used for assessment and the field work ahead. Next slide. We're also engaging stakeholders. So this weekend, I've got a meeting with Scott Mackay from Grok. I'm not sure who else is coming out. We're going to go walk the site and talk about their experience with this planning process so far, uh, the, the stuff that went into the current master plan, and then um, creating a relationship going forward for their desires. Uh, there's going to be um, a number of stakeholder meetings, so there's going to be a public info and input session in January. We're working on the dates for those. Yeah, we're hoping to tie in. Um, we're also updating our Parks and Rec Master Plan. Yeah. Uh, so we're hoping to have not only our Parks and Rec Master Plan input session, but include um, this project as well. Great. Fantastic. So whenever we do field work, we'll have interim uh, debriefs on our findings. Um, we're going to be doing a presentation of the findings from the field work. And then by May, we sh will have a draft report out, which will be available to the community for feedback. Next. So the planning field work. So um, you see these three guys with the vests out there. Um, it's getting out there. It's taking a look at the potential relative to the community desire uh, and needs. So it could be um, that we have usership that is diverse, you know? So we want to make sure that based on who we're looking to serve, that we're evaluating the potential of the terrain and figuring mm -hmm. out what we can do, you know? Um, we're going to identify points of interest, uh, much like in the current master plan, you know, they identified connectivity. And then we'll be figuring out where we can offer certain curated experiences in more of a zone-based way but we're also going to be identifying corridors for development. Um, so some areas, some lines, and based on the trail types that you saw, I mean, you can see why some mm -hmm. areas for development, like just earmarking a spot for a pump track or something like that makes sense versus trying to draw the lines for it. Um, Who's the town's primary liaison for this? It's myself and Andy for the most mm -hmm. part. Okay. So while we're in the field, we're going to be collecting geospatial data. Yeah, we're going to get out and walk, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ben, ben uh, as well. He's getting lumped in. Yeah. Good. So we're going to collect geospatial data each time we're at the site. Um, and now that's going to assist with our, our uh, analysis and recommendations. Next one. So the trails concept plan is going to be drafted. And like I said, that'll be available for feedback. That'll be a combination between... Um, the background, the existing conditions assessment, recommendations, implementation info, and then prioritize next steps. So you'll get graphical assets, which will help illustrate these ideas, and we'll make things clear. Next one. So the field design and layout portion is at the end of the project. Um, so that'll be for up to three miles of trail. So we'll be doing field-based des field design, so that's markup in the field, and that trail layout will consist of um, couple of different flagging types, mostly roll flagging like you see here hung, this was down in North Carolina. Um, and then the data from those layouts will be collected uh, and added to the, the data set. So the project life cycle. This is a little granular, <laughs> but, uh, and it's never quite a linear process. You know, it, we end up kind of cyclically evolving, but um, I wanted to highlight this because, you know, right now we're in the conceptual 
portion of this process. So the feasibility study was already done in advance, mm -hmm. you know, by by engaging the community and doing the site walks that you've done, by engaging BME and, and putting together a, a comprehensive master plan that outlined the community desire and the market analysis and the initial recon was done. You figured out the portion of the site that you were interested in offering. And so now we're really at this point where we can start to get a little conceptual about it and start to drill down and figure out some different configurations in an iterative way and um, start to make it a little more clear. And then once we evaluate the ideas, um, we can get into master planning and do design in a more granular way and then offer things like a phasing plan and cost opinions and um, any <clears throat> evaluate any permitting needs and that sort of stuff. So all this will be done communicated in a, in a public way, make sure that it's inclusive and transparent, and then that can proceed on to any sort of fundraising that needs to be done. Um, By phasing plan, do you yeah. mean like the first three miles would be a phase one? It could or be, Or do you mean yeah. splitting the three mile initial into phases? It could, it could be, so we don't know yet. I mean, it's, um, the, the point is you'll have, it, you know, the three miles or so of trail, mm -hmm. um, you will be able to do cost estimating. Hopefully some of that will come in pretty darn low. If some of it's going to be volunteer built, that could be a considerable savings. Yeah. And then some of this might need, based on the scale and scope, it, like I said, it might need more design and more engineering based on trying to drill down into some of the more bike park type stuff. So some of it might be pretty easy to specify based on the, the scope and scale. So, you know, we haven't really talked budget yet in terms of what the town's tolerance and interest level is. But, you know, I think we get into some conceptual designs first mm -hmm. and figure out what's really appealing. You know, there might be some audacious ideas that the price tags might be a little shocking up front but the desire to pursue them would mean, you know, some of the work with, that I did with the International Mountain Bicycling Association, if we offered a pump track, particularly an asphalt one or some pre-engineered features, oftentimes we would bring in a bike park specialist mm -hmm. that would then sub on a project, and that design would be done um, after the, the master plan. So you'd sort of drill down into it. But you could figure out what the scope of that was going to be to establish a budget for that work. And so it's just a, it's, right. it's a matter of how deep do you want to go with this. And right now, most of the recommendations are going to focus on natural surface trails because they're going to be the easiest to accomplish in mm -hmm. a, from a budgetary as well as an implementation perspective. But you know, you may decide in a phased way that, okay, let's offer um, soil-based dirt jumps now, and then down the line for sustainability reasons, well, maybe we offer this all on asphalt with prefabricated wooden and metal takeoffs. You know, mm -hmm. the jumps that you jump off of onto. Right. So down in Cleveland, and we'll we'll go through as we go through the process, we'll share some case studies of some things that are happening and have happened and are successful in other places and we can kind of compare those to the community desire for what they might like to see and versus the desire to go deeper with this type of stuff so you know it is a a small footprint in terms of the real estate that's offered right. and so bicycle play or bike park type recommendations do make a lot of sense um, also particularly because they are new and novel for this mm -hmm. this area, right? So um, if we're inventorying what the greater Rochester area has versus doesn't have, you know, there are these modern technologies and implementations that could be beneficial to this community and beyond, so. Are, are the maintenance components well understood? I mean, you showed that example in Arkansas where yeah. people didn't apparently anticipate well. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, it really it goes back as well to the community's um, capacity and desire to support those types of facilities in a maintenance way. I mean, yeah. you know, I, everyone's looking for as low maintenance solution as possible, but when, you know, it's always a trade-off, right? Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to resurface dirt jumps? Um, regularly as 
they were doing out in, as they're doing out in Victor, or do you want to pave it with the prospect of needing to replace it in 10 years? You know, so it's yeah. it's uh, often the maintenance costs associated with the dirt soil-based ones can be lower, but you have a more consistent and in some ways a safer product by offering more solid surface type things like an asphalt version. So, so Grok does a great job at Bay West is where I ride. Yeah, yeah. Can you count on volunteers? <laughs> well, when you do I things mean, like this? you I can mean, and you can't. I mean, Grok has been present for many, many years in this right. community and um, <clears throat> excels at doing certain types of trail work. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say from a maintenance standpoint, um, if it's something that's akin to what an employee of the town would do, the answer is probably no. You know, if you expected that accountability of, right. of doing it consistently, I mean, volunteers are volunteers and you just, you can't expect them to punch a clock and, mm -hmm. and do it with the frequency and accountability with which an employee would do it. But in partnership, you might figure mm -hmm. out that uh, something similar, you know, to achieving that frequency is doable. It would just have to be an agreed on yeah. thing. You know, it's difficult, especially in the volunteer world, you have turnover too. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, life happens and it's gonna be the first thing that right. that goes away. So, you know, the, the it's gonna be a conversation going forward. and. We'll figure out. Um, traditionally, the pump track out in Victor has kind of languished, and people realize that soil-based pump tracks aren't viable. You know, they're great for proof of concept that mm -hmm. people love it, just like they love a brand new puppy. <laughs> but when it when it starts to come apart, and it's it quickly becomes something that is too challenging to uphold. Right. You know, and to offer <clears throat> because it's like when you have something that's so precisely curated, like a pump track, it needs to function mm -hmm. at its highest level in order to offer the experiences that people are looking for. And if right. it doesn't, um, out in Victor, I'll tell you that that pump track, uh, in its dogged condition, that soil-based pump track, people still love it. Mm -hmm. You know, they still ride the heck out of it. Yeah, I think that that shows just how much use is out there, you know, from going to all the, yeah. you know, the... Uh, the drier roads, the Bay Park West, you know, yeah. it's it's packed in the yeah. summer, spring and fall and, and even in the winter now. Yeah. Um, so I I think even looking at, you know, that volunteer talk and the and the town work, you know, mm -hmm. compared to the other locations, you know, ours is a smaller footprint and it's not as many trails, so it might mean not as many volunteers and hopefully, you know, yeah. through all the years of, you know, Grox work and working with Victor and the county and stuff like that, I'd like to think probably technology over the last 15, 20 years has only increased in sustainability features. So hopefully some of that will yeah. decrease the amount of volunteer and maintenance needed, but that might mean costs <laughs> would go into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm not familiar with the term pump trick, um, but I've been out to drier roads. So mm -hmm. is one of is that? Yeah, one of the features adjacent to the parking area is a pump track. It's on the left hand side, is okay. about midway up the parking lot. Okay. Uh, a pump track is basically like a closed circuit trail. So it's uh, you navigate a. It's basically a trail that has a series of rollers, undulations called rollers and in slope turns called berms that look like waves of, of dirt. And by pedaling and then coasting and unweighting and then compressing the front end and then the back end of your bike in sort of a pumping action, you can propel yourself through this closed circuit track. Um, it's a great fitness builder. It's a great skill builder. Um, when you're doing it at a moderate to high speed, it feels like floating and flying and surfing. And so it's sensations that traditionally you didn't get uh, on the trail because trails weren't built with that level of nuance and sort of curation to the shapes. But now you're seeing even locally. So we built a trail this year <coughs> called Rufus out at Dryer Road Park. and. And that trail is extreme, it's like a flow trail. You know, when we talked about sort of that flow experience, 
it's got rollers and berms and jumps and that sort of stuff on it, um, akin to a pump track in a more of a point-to-point -point format. But a pump track is, um, it goes back to that social center, you know, having a social hub. It's a great place for kids to kind of hang out, and get a workout, have fun um, in more of a contained context. Uh, generally, there aren't a lot of trees around, but you know, certain designs, you can find pump tracks mixed in to more of a forested setting. Um, increasingly, you're seeing pump tracks being made out of asphalt for sustainability reasons, environmental sustainability reasons. Um, you know, economically, they're expensive. You know, you're looking at 30 to 40 bucks a square foot on those. Mm. So the cost adds up pretty quickly. You know, you're talking about 100, 1,000 square feet. You know, you're mm -hmm. talking or 10,000 square feet, which is yeah, that could be like phase often 10. necessary. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, but uh, again, a pump track, um, you might decide that it's better to put your your money and energy someplace else. You know, like so. I'll be contacting Roots and the local NICA group, which is the National Interscholastic Cycling Association. It's a, a youth development racing organization. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll be talking about them and their needs and what they're looking for from a skills development perspective. So, you know, we may be focusing less on the pump track format and more on like progressive drops or jumps or, you know, if you go to dryer, generally you see the kids on the jumps, lapping them all day long. And mm -hmm. so it's a very high yield, high experience uh, investment. So likely, you know, they're going to be iterative versions of, of jumps planned into the system. You know, one might be more of a, a learning type of context and one might be a trail type context. Mm -hmm. So, um, any other questions? Um, so at the end, when, when we have a plan at the end, how long, how, how permanent is that plan? I mean, you're, you're talking about putting um, flags up to, to mark the exact trail and then you mentioned that it, that data ends up going into does that go into a map into GIS and something that's easily reproducible while, while the funds get put together for this whole thing or do the flags have to stay up the whole time until it's until it's actually built? I mean, yeah. is it something that's going to be like a crunch as soon as that the plan's no. done to construct or no. is it no, easily easily navigate yeah. navigatable navigable navigable yeah good question yeah, yeah. yeah great question so once the flag lines are up you know the the flagging tape that we use is not what you get at the hardware store it's a little heavier duty and it's going to last you multiple years if you know and if you don't get those up as you're suggesting you can um, download a geo referenced map to your smartphone and then you can use that to navigate the trail corridor as it was laid out. So if for some reason someone's not happy with the fact that there's some trail planning going on at Shadow Pines, and we've in, encountered this in the past, that you know, it, when, when people get attached to a natural place and they, they find their flow there, no matter what their modality is, they may object to any sort of development. Um, you know, you've heard of NIMBYs, mm -hmm. not in my backyard, absolutely. but there are also the bananas out there build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. No, I haven't heard that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you may find that there are some people out there that object to this process happening because they've, they've found a sense of place at Shadow Pines mm -hmm. in the new context. So, you know, there's also the concept of Maya. Maya is most advanced yet acceptable. And sometimes these ideas take time for people to be with in order to. So this planning process, uh, mm -hmm. it's a small site, but generally, you know, planning processes do take up about a year or so. So we're accelerating this one to six months. Um, okay. That's one of the challenges is, is uh, making sure that, as I said, it's an inclusive, transparent process to where people have the opportunity to be with the ideas, uh, that they have notification, 
that they understand the ideas and to the best of our ability we'll be making recommendations that hopefully promote as little conflict as possible through good design. So, and there are lots of different ways to do that from simply making a trail rise before a blind corner versus descending into it, you know? So, and they're just simple, simple recommendations, um, but knowing how to offer those recommendations and how to do things at a system level and then all the way down to an individual trail alignment and then down to an individual feature, you know, we'll be making recommendations in the form of trail alignments, but also trail types um, and narratives that offer the experiences that people are looking for and, and trying to concert those in a configuration sort of way so that it, it reduces potential conflict. How big is the property that you have to work with? You know, uh, 35 acres was what was recommended by the consultant. Um, although, as we've talked so far, you know, we have some connectivity um, right. challenges ahead of us. So, mm -hmm. you know, the the multi-use cross-country network, as it's defined by the the master plan, you know, there are access points for the surrounding communities all around the property, and if we want to make sure that um, the cyclist traffic has access to the bike focused area within the property, we are going to have to provide some connectivity via those access points through the property in order to, to make those connections. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not talking mountain biking trails throughout the property, but we are talking some sort of access in order to access the areas that are more specialized for off-road cycling. So, you know, the recommendations, as I said, they're going to span from um, very bike-specific stuff, directional trails, jumps, jump features and things like that, those will not be shared use, you know? You don't want people walking on those trails. And we're, there are gonna be plenty of recommendations that focus on connectivity, on inclusive design, on accessible accessibility for people with disabilities, on maybe catering to emerging technologies like e-technologies for elder populations, you know? How can we, with these, with this potential that we have, with these resources, offer the most well-rounded options for recreation and and serve the most people with as little conflict as possible. Mm -hmm. So it's it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. It's, it's a good puzzle to have before us. You know, I think we, the input meeting in January will be very interesting. Yeah, to see what yeah, the yeah. diversity of the community yeah. is mm -hmm. really interested in for that. Yeah. And uh, you know, one of the things that we've talked about, the recommendations that we make, we will be making a lot of zone-focused recommendations. Um, and you know, we want to try to, as we make um, the ideas available, we want to talk in higher level ways as much as possible. Less about the specific alignments, but more in the community goals that we're trying to support and achieve. So it's less about where and it's more about who and what and how, right? So we'll get to those trail alignments, but we're not gonna pick fights by drawing lines first thing. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna make sure that the community gets excited about the ideas and the potential technologies and how to, how to make sure that we can support each other in our recreation pursuits. Yeah, I, th I think there'll be a big education piece to this as well for the community and, you know, from the rec department standpoint, you know, moving forward, you know, we got to learn more about it too when it comes to shared use trails. But, you know, I think in discussing with, um, you know, Victor specifically, um, just learning, you know, kind of picking their brains on how Dryer Road started and, and how that moved forward and, and, and learning kind of on the fly with Tim and I going from, you know, we we thought, oh, you know, we'll just come in there and the parks department can go in there and, and we've learned so much and gotten so much education, uh, you know, through our site walks and discussions. But I think there's that education piece will be very vital in those public information sessions, but um, great things to kind of discuss on, you know, if you look at the property too, you know, this is one of the only portions uh, if you've looked at some of the projects that have taken place at Shadow Pines, this is a portion that 
people might go on, but there's probably a lot of the people that use Shadow Pines every day that haven't gone on that portion. So yeah. just because it's bike specific, you know, that hope to have shared use trails, it's also going to be for a lot of people a new experience at Shadow Pines to be able to walk those trails, run those trails, bike those trails. So yeah. I think that's the exciting piece that, you know, from Tim and I, when we discuss this and we sight walk, it's like, wow, I've, I've never been back there. You yeah. know, this is going to be a huge new piece to a, a wonderful property that we have for the town. Definitely. I think the uh, shared use, uh, I like hearing that over and over again because uh, that's uh, the other parts of Shadow Pines right now. The shared use concept is extremely important to make sure that the community is comfortable with people walking or mm -hmm. disc golfing and, and, mm -hmm. and such. So um, to have that as a primary consideration in the yeah. planning event is really important to me. And I think that's going to lead to some good community input going back to the January yeah. meeting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's a there's a concept called goal interference you may be familiar with. And it, the idea is that, again, everyone goes into the, the woods or into park settings for different objectives, right? Their experience goals are somewhat specific. And just certain use types can be inherently conflicting. So, you know... Um, one of the projects that I worked on this past year was the West Hill Preserve down in Naples for the Nature Conservancy. And in the initial um, stakeholder meetings that we had had, um, mountain biking groups showed up, hiking groups showed up, and it was clear from the onset that the hiking groups really didn't want to share the trails with the cyclist traffic. And often what you hear um, in opposition to sharing is, well, bikes are dangerous, they run people off of trails, and they damage the environment. And, you know, to not even contest those things at this point in time, you know, I'll say that, that hikers and cyclists just have very, often have very different reasons for being out there. You know, um, a cyclist might <clears throat> be out there for the thrill of the experience and for mm -hmm. that challenge that we talked about and for fitness and foot traffic might be out there to look at birds and to just wander and be at peace and nature bathe and so it's important mm -hmm. to recognize what people are looking for you know there might be a trail recommendation that isn't even shared use that we that we offer that says this is the foot traffic only trail and you know it's because it's a smaller footprint and it's going to allow people to be back in this space not saying that we will but we might you mm -hmm. know, so in the West Hill plan, and that was 550 acres, um, there is a foot traffic only trail, and it's a relocation of the Finger Lakes Trail Spur that goes through that property. And the reason why it was relocated was so that it wasn't at the heart of the property and in the middle of the trail network configuration, which was more likely to promote conflict than relocating it to the edge of the property. So by relocating it, we achieved a couple different things. We reduced the amount of road walking on that particular through hike. We took a half mile off of the road walk for them. And it also got it over to an edge of the property where they were less likely to experience seeing a, a cyclist, which inherently would be a buzzkill. So, mm -hmm. you know, there, there needs to be some honesty in the conversation about what people are looking for and that's why I, I focused so much on the experience based design portion of this is like understanding the user psychology and and what creates that sense of fulfillment is extremely important to being able to provide the right types of facilities uh, i come out of the hiking world yeah part of the finger lakes trail organization but anytime i've been any place that has uh, cyclists on it mm -hmm. Never had a problem. They're Good. always so polite. You're Good. down by Tryon. Yeah. So. Good. Nice job, Ben. I think it works great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It can happen, you know, and then sometimes it's just an accident that someone feels like they got run off the trail. Um, but I think it, locally we're, we're seeing a lot of success stories of shared use trails, and we're starting to see a culture of sharing, which is wasn't there before, you know, and it's mm -hmm. taken time to evolve. Probably more of an awareness that there's going to be possibly bikers yeah. on the trail, right? Yeah, so definitely. As a hiker, you're aware that that's going to happen. And yeah. As a bicyclist, you're going to know that there might be hikers there. So yeah, yeah, that's so really key. Definitely. Yeah. So in the early years of shared use trails around here, it's like people needed to come to terms with it, right? Most advanced yet acceptable, and uh, 
it's like that new car design that you think is hideous that over time it starts to look cool to you and then it becomes <laughs> dated. So, yeah, we're hoping that the, the concept of shared use trails around here that people are increasingly comfortable and not even phased by the fact that they see cyclists on the trail anymore. But, you know, as we said, right now you don't have a lot of cyclist traffic in there and you have increased dog walkers and mm -hmm. uh, there is that sense of ownership that's being fostered there and, and change is hard for people, especially if they're not proxy to it sometimes. So it's going to be our task to make sure that we communicate these ideas to make that planning process inclusive and you know, to just do the best possible design that we can in order to make sure that people are still getting what they need out of the, the property. All right. Excellent. Well, that was 15 minutes, right? That was <laughs> well, way beyond, but thank you. It's super important to recognize the, the communication and the education piece because it will be, it will be a factor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Absolutely. got some cards here. Um, yeah. Thank you. Come in and talk. Yeah, I have a whole ton of questions. So. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, yeah, anytime. Talk to I talked to Allison Agresta about what you did up West Hill too. Oh, cool. Yeah, cool. she had very good things to say. Yeah. <laughs> of Thank course, you. it's a nice property to work with there. Thanks a lot. You bet. Okay. Any other thank questions? You. Thank you. Adam. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Cheers. Thanks, man. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Moving on. Um, the next topic on the agenda is the Channock Philbrick yeah. Park Trail Bridge replacement and I think um, with the completion of the connection to Spring Lake Park we've seen increased traffic on that trail so this is a uh, timely that the town is uh, is active on this and I think um, Tim I don't know if you have any new information or I know it was just something was just voted on this past uh, um, town board session about MRB being able to engineer a plan for that so we're in the works right now. Right. So they authorized, um, is it MBE? MRB, I believe. Yeah, MRB. To, to go ahead and yes. develop a plan. Yep. So yes. it's basically the phase one. Yep. Do you know the time frame? Time frame, I have no idea on the front time frame. I just know that from other work that we've tried to do um, along around the Quick Creek and stuff, it all depends on the salmon run and when we can actually start getting... If this, if the bid goes through and they approve it, it's going to be more of a um, summertime deal. Okay. I was going to say, Parrington, I'm Parrington saying that you can only do work June 1st through November 1st or something? Correct. Yes. It's a bit, we, is our goal to get it done I would 2024? Hope. I would hope. Okay. Yep. And I, and I believe, from my limited knowledge on the actual scope of the project, but... I believe you know there's there's so many different sections of when stuff was updated and when things were put in. I believe the whole plan is to update everything and make it one unified kind of bridge area so everything that's constructed uh, goes together. Because I know that there's a newer part you know that's you know different composite and things right. like that. Where I think this would the the scale of the project right now is to really take care of everything. Yeah, because right now the idea would be, unless um, MRB comes up back with something different, it would be taking out those three separate bridges and then making one long, give or take, 300-foot uh, boardwalk walkway. I know that railing came down. Is that still down, or were you able to get it back? Yeah, we, we, we temporarily fixed it. Okay. Yeah. Is there a proposal available for anyone to see, or is that still it's just internal? Just internal, I believe. I'm sure if you go to the website, if, if it's up yeah. there, I, I'm, I'm not positive, to be mm -hmm. honest. Okay, so those were the listed uh, parks updates, but Tim, oftentimes you like to comment on some of the work yeah, you're doing. You have yeah, just a couple things. We've been just getting ready for winter time. We did take a um, class through Relief. It's an organization that puts on classes every once in a while, once a month. Um, this. Uh, it was in November. The um, topic was um, uh, tree storm management, so before, after, and during, if there's a big uh, windstorm, ice storm, that kind of stuff, um, how to manage the trees um, between identifying problems, um, negating problems before they became become a problem, uh, that kind of thing. So that was a very interesting class that our whole staff went to. Um, we took down tennis nets, got uh, soccer goals all put away, and uh, 
annuals and grasses. We cut, cut all those down, pulled them up, and then we helped assist the facilities with the tree at the Four Corners the, at Shuffleburger Park. So that was a couple of the things that we did. <laughs> Just a couple. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next, it would be the uh, Penfield Trails Committee update. Uh, Bob, you want to do that? Um, yeah, we continue to do our guided hikes. We had a great hike this past Saturday out at Sherwood Fields. Um, 23 or 24 people came out. So it was well received. Awesome. It was gorgeous weather for Saturday in December. So, um, and come January, Ellison Park, and actually hoping for some snow, because actually it's fun in the snow to, <laughs> what's not, not fun is when we've, in the past, we've had chance where it's actually had to be canceled because it was too cold, but. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see what happens in January. Um, but our schedule is set for all of next year. I didn't think to bring any of the cards, do you, Andy? I know, I believe I brought them to the last meeting and handed it out to everyone, the little okay. bookmark cards. They're available for, at the Recreation Department. And if anybody does want to register for the hikes, even now for the 2024, you can contact the rec department or go online. I'll double check to make sure that the 2024 is updated, but you're able to do it online or call in. And then the other thing that you know we've got on our plans for trying to look at next year is to update the, Fair, or the Wegmans uh, passport book. Um, because among other things, Shadow Pines isn't there. It's also not on the website in the list of for under, in the Penfield Trails. We don't even mention Shadow Pines. That was one thing that we kind of, we were holding off on, not particularly for a, a long time. I know there's trails that we can hike there. We haven't labeled any of them because of um, a lot of the projects that were going on there between the proposed pickleball, um, disc golf, which is already completed. Um, that's in its first full year or over a year now and um, with the stuff going on on the back nine. So we haven't had like a real... Um, I think we've been calling that, you know, stay on the paths because most of them are cart paths. And I think, I, I know we've done a couple walks out there when, when disc golf was first established to start to look at that trail engagement involvement to say, hey, where would this be appropriate? But I think like Tim said, once a lot of these larger things gets established, then I think we'll start to define trails and, and post it then rather than update it kind of sporadically. Hopefully it takes sooner rather than later, but there's always that piece. But I think that's why they're not, we've yeah. tried to not have them on the, on the website. Yeah. Um, so one comment, so Shorewood Fields, where we hiked mm -hmm. Saturday, the kiosk is pretty rough. Yep. Is that on any kind of list? I mean, I know we all nod our heads. We know it's in rough shape, but... yep. So we, we have been relying on Boy Scout projects to update these kiosks, and we're get, we haven't gotten a lot in recently, and um, we, had, do we, have, we do have some comments about if um, Boy Scout projects come in, we might push them towards the benches at um, Shadow Pines, that kind of thing. But we usually leave it up to the scouts to say, like, hey, we have a kiosk here or we have benches here. We give them the option to make mm -hmm. the choice of. But even just, and I know that one's screwed, Shot. That's information one. The, the the sheets are falling down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think wet we, and stuff. I wonder whether we can update those. I think when we we went around for the last couple of years and did kind of an inventory to start to recognize and to point Boy Scouts or Eagle Scouts, I should say, to those different projects. I think those were more on the bottom of the list because the actual kiosks themselves weren't in terrible shape. I and mean, you know, right. the Channing Philbrick one as well, you know, they're the larger size ones. But I think we identified those as those informational ones where that really need to be updated. We've tried to push for more of the display cases. As you saw, Marco's, mm -hmm. you know, there needs to be that lock. And I, if it does get updated, we're hoping to have more of that swing for, uh, you know, the rec department and trails and, and even this committee to be able to update that stuff. So I think that that could be a, a future, uh, relatively near future, uh, to update those sort of things. But I know in some of them we had to go and unscrew, and it's, it yeah. caused more damage than it did. Um, you don't have to build a new kiosk. Necessarily. Right, right. You right. Some new plexiglass and some and a updated information. But I, I know we've talked about it at the trails level, you know, back when I was, you know, on that as well, coming up with some 
sort of a formal, you know, this is what every trail kiosks has. You know, it has the map, it has the general rules. Uh, I think that might be a, a good time number. to start it. Again, I don't know if that's the trails. I think we kind of discussed it might be better for the rec department to maybe control due to having that. But maybe if it started at trails to say what kind of information would, uh, you know, the general trail hiker need to see. And then we could maybe start to go into all of our kiosks and say, okay, this is more formal. And we update them all based on size. And I know the conversation was started way back when, but... Didn't Where come you, fruition, so. You didn't talk to us. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, and just so that they're all uniform. So, you yeah, know, no, when you go up to every kiosk, whatever park you're in or trail you're in, the map's going to be in this corner, just an example of that corner, yada, yada, yada. Well, yeah, there should be some core information and then yes. some park specific. Yep. Know, disc golf, whatever. Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I think it might even be a good time, like you're talking about Shadow Pines trails and things like that. It might be even a nice time to update some of our trail maps, too. So I can certainly start that conversation uh, with our planning department and, and engineers and see if we can And that can, that. that can coincide with the Wegmans book because they go hand in hand with the trails map because that's a little pocket, pocket trails map. Mm -hmm. um, side note about Ellison Park, the um, guided hike which entrance because that's usually a topic of people don't understand which entrance yeah. do you guys go so there are two talk about that over the course of the year and they start at different places so one is off blossom road blossom north blossom road north where the ice rink used to be okay mm -hmm. yeah that's the that's the january and then the summer or fall whenever that one is i don't remember off the top of my head is off old penfield road so it's that coyote den trailhead up there right. So and that's what the county site calls uh, Ellison South. Okay. <laughs> oh. But we call Ellison South Blossom. Right. Penfield Road is South. I guess Road. South. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to argue with that. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's inconsistent, and at the end of the day, people use Google Maps, and that comes and that's different anyway. Right. So it's it's a challenge to get people in the right place. At least January, bottom of the hill, old ice skating rink, yeah. large parking lot. Yeah, and then you just go across and up to Fort Schuyler for yeah. donuts. Okay. And cool. All right, thank you. I thought 2023 was an excellent year. I thought the hikes that I was a, a part of were really well attended. And a, a lot more people, I think, if I know yeah. people registered. I think the, the boot rating scale was tremendous for a lot of people that typically called into the rec department asking hey in prior even for for us from the rec department you know we knew enough about the trail obviously it depends on the conditions but you guys you know putting that boot rating scale of how difficult it is i think was a huge plus for for a lot of those trails so thank you well one of the things that was encouraging in november somehow the word got out among the local girl scouts said oh come to the hike so we suddenly had all these people show up that weren't registered which was fine um and the girl scouts seemed to enjoy it and then this past weekend we had some of them come back so that was actually nice mm -hmm. to see oh that's great with friends so, so yes cool <laughs> very cool so hopefully they'll come every yeah mm -hmm. what happens when there's a lot of snow do people show up in snowshoes or is it just a very much more challenging hike or um for the Ellison Park one, we've had snowshoes, cross-country skis, and people in you know, with good snow boots on. Last year, it was there wasn't that much snow, so I think with one person on skis, our else was just walking. Uh, as, as hike leaders, we bring snowshoes <laughs> and cross-country skis and wear good boots, and so we were prepared if there were people trying who wanted to do different modal mm -hmm. <laughs> forms of modality to, to work to work with them um, so we try to accommodate and then, and then same in february <clears throat> the, um, moon hike mm -hmm. um, at night which is are those are just short little 15 20 minute hikes that we do three different rounds of them um, i've done them in snowshoes and i've done them hiking on bare ground so it's never know what we're going to get and last year we didn't get anything right <laughs> Those weather-dependent events, yes, <laughs> yes. We love those. All right, moving on. Uh, 
Penfield recreation updates. Andrew, what do you have for us? Yep. Um, so uh, the rec department just last week um, on December 4th was our first day of registration for our winter spring programs. Um, and we saw a huge first day mainly, um, which was our uh, recreation summer camp. Um, so it was wonderful to see that some of our weeks, which is over 200 or so kids, um, a lot of those spots filled, you know, day one. I'd even say before 8 a.m. some of the weeks filled. Um, uh, it's, it's a great problem to have, but I think also at the same time, I think it shows that there's a large need for, for that. Uh, I think we run a great program. We're very cost effective. Um, another thing that attributed to it was some of the feedback we heard last year was some people weren't aware because um, last year we filled kind of as after the first week of registration, um, but this year it was kind of day one. Uh, so some of the feedback we received last year about people not knowing, you know, we really tried to put it out on our website, put communications. Uh, we emailed all of our previous participants to let them know, and obviously that uh, caused uh, day one uh, registration being so large. So um, it's a good problem to have, but then at the other side, we also look at, you know, what is the best way to register for a large program like this? Um, so the rec department and myself um, are continuing to look at how other departments and municipalities do their summer camp. Um, we're one of the first ones that do get put out um, into the public. We look at um, us having a winter and spring brochure where other uh, municipalities might just do a singular winter brochure and then, a, then they offer their summer camp in spring. So because we do ours so early and it is cost effective, I think that is the large um, registration. But at the same time, the nice thing is when you look at last year and you look at this year, knowing that it's that first week of registration, we know that Penfield residents are the ones that are reserving and registering for those spots. So there's also that part of us that look at, this is benefiting the Penfield community right away. <laughs> Although there are large wait lists and we're continuing to look to hire staff and certainly find other facilities to house these sort of programs in. But um, you know we understand there's a lot of people that have this need over the summer for this kind of a program, which we're, we're happy to provide, but definitely looking to uh, make it easier and better for all involved, for people that unfortunately haven't gotten a spot yet. So we'll continue to communicate and look at that sort of a program. But um, some of the just general numbers from the first day uh, that I wanted to share was um, in one day alone, um, in 2022, when we registered for 2023, we brought in just shy of $100,000. And at that point, we couldn't have been happier with doing that um, for day one. This year, we brought in $210,000. So um, again, that's a credit to our recreation department, certainly not just summer camp in itself. It certainly was a large proponent of it, um, but really just our using our facility and programming with outside organizations, trying to fit our 10,000 square feet worth of program space um, to the max with as many programs that are popular around. So uh, just really looking forward in, to going into next year uh, and very thankful that our registration numbers are so high. Yeah, we had, uh, um, it's such a desirable program that a friend and coworker, they set their alarm for midnight so they could be first on. <laughs> and he, he wasn't the only one. He, he, Texted his neighbor, made sure, and she was already up. That was getting, posted on Facebook as well. Yes. Yeah. So okay. So, hmm. it, and it's it, again like we're continuing to look at you know for lodges we open that at 10 a.m. Um, and we did that actually last Wednesday for for the next year's lodges uh, whether it be open pavilions or enclosed lodges that's one at 10 a.m. specific. That's kind of been that way for many many years. When it comes to the program registration, we've always gone by the day of. So technically, you know, on the website, you can go in at midnight. There's all of these different factors, uh, especially for a program like summer camp that we are just continuing to look at. Um, so certainly if there's people out there watching this and want to provide feedback, you know, email the recreation department. Um, but we're just 
trying to find the best way uh, to have that registration start for a program like that because we do know a lot of people went on at midnight, mm-hmm. which you know could be a bad thing, could be a good thing, maybe <laughs> maybe not, not for people staying no, up it's so just late. A, uh, but again, just trying to work the best for the community. But very excited, nonetheless. It's a good problem to have for mm-hmm. for a popular programs that we have here in the town. And Joel said for the lodge rentals that most of the key dates were gone like within 15 minutes. Yep, I do have some some data on that. Again, it's mainly. Um, uh, financial base, but for 2023, our day one, we brought in 101 reservations, uh, which accounted for $17,680. And day one this year, which was the 6th of December, we did 116 for $20,460. So a slight increase. Um, I will say from the recreation department side of things, when we have events at Harris Whalen um, or things at Dolomite, there are a lot of times where we pre-book that before it goes out. Um, Our summer camp program is one of those. Um, Because we um, have 140 kids at our community center um, for seven to eight weeks out of the summer, um, we have been, ever since COVID, starting to utilize our Dolomite Lodge for our daytime education at recreation programs, a lot of uh, education-based learning, lectures, things like that. We also book, you know, Monday through Friday, our Harris Whalen Lodge to supplement our dance programs, our yoga programs. Mm. Again, you know, uh, a facility space is something that I think we're bursting at the th- seams. It's nothing new with the Penfield Recreation Center, but I think the rec department has done an awesome job at looking at what other facilities can we offer these programs. Um, of course, we'd love to have them all on one campus and in one spot, but uh, I think it just shows, and unfortunately that affects some of the lodge users and, and that c- kind of community service, but to use that Monday through Friday over the summer where we don't see a lot of the lodge rentals uh, be as vast compared to previous years. We're now using that for program space. So um, a little bit extra work and planning for the rec department, but you know the enrollment numbers obviously show uh, we're, we're trying to do a good thing. Um, All good news though. Yeah, good, yeah, excited. Good, good problems they have. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, the second bullet, you know, 2024 events and concerts. Uh, we are starting to plan our summer concert series, which is at our Penfield Amphitheater located behind uh, Town Hall. Typically, that's between June and August. Uh, we did have some rainouts last year, so those groups uh, hopefully will be coming back, um, as that's our typical policy. Um, another big uh, item to talk about is the eclipse, uh, which is in April. Uh, we are planning an event to take place at Harris Whalen, um, basically having some food trucks, some potential music, things like that, uh, just as a general area for people to meet if they'd like to come and do that. Uh, more information will be provided in, uh, on our website as that starts to come together. Uh, we've purchased some uh, glasses and things like that. I know we're working with the library, with the school district to kind of bring and pool all of our resources into one spot. Uh, again, at Harris Whalen will be the focal point, but we're also going to put information out, you know, talking about, hey, you can go to the Shadow Pines, you can go to Rafa's Park as good viewing areas, but we're kind of focusing where our event is at Harris Whalen at this point. And then, uh, of course, we have all of our other uh, typical recreation department events that take place um, throughout the year and uh, will be posted on the website and updated in January. Um, one big thing that we started to see the last couple of years due to COVID is really just outside organizations starting to throw their own events. And uh, a lot of our time, um, mainly my time, uh, through the rec department has been working with these groups over the summer to ensure that they're providing uh, an appropriate event, but also communicating and, and doing their due diligence to making sure they have the insurances, the, the generators for power, the food truck permits and things like that. So uh, just really excited for more of those community-based events, but again, a little bit of work on our end to make sure that they're, uh, they're up and running well. But uh, yeah, really looking forward to that. People have been reserving the amphitheater behind us for their own events and things like that. We haven't started that yet, but most likely that's going to continue to grow into 2024. That's it Very for, good. for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is the Clark Road Barn Committee update, which serves the liaison from this group to that. I, I don't know of any 
what the activity is? Tim and I are also liaisons on that. Okay. I do know that at the recent town board meeting, um, we put out an RFP um, for someone to come in and just evaluate the structure itself to say what conditions it is. It's something that the group and the committee had already started to do, and I think through that process saw, hey, we really need to get somebody in here with a little bit more um, education and experience with that. Not that we don't have people on that committee that have that, um, but to have something in writing with a group that's done that more formally. So mm -hmm. I know that that is starting to move forward, and um, I believe that goes out, uh, and we're expecting to get um, kind of some of those specs back in early January. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the master plan update committee? Yep, so we've had uh, a couple meetings so far with the master plan update committee. Um, one of our last meetings was a presentation from um, Chris Lopez and Cortland Sutton, um, starting to look at gathering some more data on what a potential rec center could look like. Um, again, a lot of this, I know I mentioned this at our last meeting, but a lot of this is purely data driven. Um, so when um, Adam was doing his presentation and talking about some of those um, input meetings from the community, we're trying to tie that in with our master plan update that will, ha will have a large piece of this, of this rec center. Uh, again, I think I have to stay it uh, every time I'm talking about this, but in no way is this going to a board. It's not planned on being voted on. It's mainly just gathering information. So if and when this ever happens in the future, um, at least it's tied into the master plan and we can start to get community input um, a little bit more specific to um, what the community is looking for to have that kind of extra step in the future so we don't have to necessarily pay or, or take the time um, looking at that. And our next meeting is the 27th of December where we're starting to put that stuff together. Very good, thank you. Okay, uh, Parks and Rec Advisory Committee, that's us. Uh, appointments and meeting schedule for 2024. So I, I put this on there just because last meeting I had mentioned to anybody in the committee to, to contact me if they uh, weren't interested on uh, remaining on the committee. Thankfully, I didn't hear from anyone, so no news is good news. Uh, looking forward to having all of these committee members back uh, for 2024. So um, from the Rec Department, Parks Department, Town, thank you guys so much for, for being on this committee. Um, and I emailed, I believe, to the group as well, our tentative meeting schedule for next year. It's the same kind of uh, general schedule that we had for this year, the second Tuesday of each month, 6 p.m. here at the town hall. Uh, and we'll take um, July and August off due to uh, crazy recreation parks and everyone's schedules during that time. <laughs> right. Um, sounds good. Yeah. All right, great. So that covers all the discussion points. We'll just quickly step through uh, the remaining items. So other business, I uh, have none. Um, we use held items to track open action items. So the first one, Andrew, is, has to do with the uh, easements, with the idea of somehow connecting Channing Philbrick with Ellison Park. Yep. And we know there's a town property and et cetera. And yep. I think it's an ongoing discussion. Yep, I contacted the town engineer and had an awesome discussion with him that you know the parcel that is owned by the town currently is leased uh, to Gentles uh, for their farming. Um, I, he wasn't 100% on what the terms uh, of the lease was, um, but certainly we're hoping in the future whether that lease comes up in the near future, uh, but maybe even starting to have some of those conversations with Gentles to say, hey, what are the thoughts here? Is there something that we can do? Uh, certainly, obviously, want to be, um, you know, in terms of that agreement, you know, not pushing too hard on enforcing anything, but I, I do think coming from this committee and hearing from the community uh, talking about connectivity, you know, that's a big piece that uh, that could connect those two points and multiple parks and then all the way up to Rondequoit. So uh, I think we'll, once I hear back from the town engineer with more thoughts, as he was going to look a little bit more into that kind of parcel, um, I'll report back to the board, but uh, hoping for, for something, whether it's uh, working with Gentles or right. eventually down the line, maybe turning that into some sort of a formal trail. Um, I don't know. 
Yeah, I think probably Trails Committee would love to see that and kind of see the property <coughs> lines and really dig in to the details. Yeah, I've, see, I've seen other trails down the Finger Lakes Trail, you know, lots of sections where it just runs along the side of a farmer's field, you know, with yeah. permission and all that stuff. So it usually works pretty well. Yeah, I mean, without talking to them yet, I think yeah. you'd walk in with those lines thinking, you know, that that would be the case, but can't speak to it before <laughs> talking to them. But yeah. Whether the, the entrance to Ellison is there or further up the road in actual Ellison, how do you get, would it be possible to ask DPW or, or who, who would you even ask to, to make it safer to walk there, mm -hmm. to, to make that actual connection? Because I think that's probably the main drawback. That's, it's really, that, that, that extra access would be great but to know that you could safely walk from down in the valley over well, there, to There's the sidewalk on the north side of Penfield Road. The, the real key is, can we get a trail under that bridge, under the Penfield Road bridge along the creek? Hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I, th I think that's kind of part of that, uh, that discussion on, you know, uh, parking in general. If it's, you know, that destination where you start there, maybe you don't start down at you know, Channing Philbrick, even though there may be potential connection concerns. But I think even starting at the top to say, if that's your starting point to get all the way up to Arondekoy, where, where do you park, where do you go? Mm. Um, I think that would be looked into once that kind of conversation starts. But yeah, I think that's going to be a huge piece right. um, to that as well. And then it's touch definitely on a Bob's focus, point. The focus of the master plan update, the parks section of that master yeah. plan. Yeah, I just, I just see it like, Painted green with cool plaques and stuff, saying this is part of the, you know, whatever, whatever we, whatever the trail is named, you know, yeah. and, and advertise it. I mean, ad, yeah. adver, advertise it as a destination kind of thing. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, I'll I'll continue to follow up with okay. um, Parks and Rec advisory and then trails uh, if I deem it, you know, yeah. needed to be going down there, pass along to you guys. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, last month, I think Steve brought up, you know, a, a, he had done a survey of the golf disc community, mm -hmm. and they came up with a bunch of just uh, some loose ideas. And so, so I ran some of the ideas by, you know, our director of public works, Andy. Um, the benches, I think we're going to try to push Boy Scout projects towards benches, that kind of thing. Um, the exposed wires, that's something that the parks department slash facilities can handle come spring, summertime. Um, Parking lot repaint, repainting, I did mention that to our director of public works. He said that's definitely an option for next year, even if we don't go ahead with that, the new lodge that's proposed or going out. Um, and then um, Whalen Road signage, I believe that would be something we'd have to go to the town board for to get something, if we want it to match something that's like out in front of this building, community center, that kind of thing with like a little plaque under it saying disc golf, lodge bathroom that kind of thing um cool thank you and i did look at those the non-plum toilets those are pretty cool yeah they are they interesting are. very interesting concept it, it's a very interesting yes concept. and uh just from the fact that the low maintenance on uh on a toilet is Correct. a good idea right so is there any follow-up on those though? on those that that's something cool? we'll just have to run up the ladder to see if it's viable for if I believe if the town board would believe that would be a necessity if that lodge doesn't go through, does go through with the outside bathrooms connected there if they want more like inside of the actual um, property. I'm not sure that uh, the outhouse idea is so much to replace a major bathroom area in some of these, but, but more in kind of the remote areas, right? Even yes. If back by the mountain bike trails, it might be a, a decent idea to have something back there yeah. where the, everything kind of begins. But um, it was just another thing to look at, right? That's yeah. all that was. So. I think it was great feedback and some good points to talk. And certainly, you know, you know, I think when we looked at the at the restrooms too, we had already kind of started to have that conversation with the disc golf association. Um, that was one that we weren't aware of, so we were just thinking, you know, the portables and things like yep. that. But uh, good options to have, kind of 
in the future for, well, for that remote area. They're aesthetically a little bit more pleasing mm -hmm. than the, the, the plastic outhouses. Yep. I mean, they're oh, all we've gotten some pretty nice ones. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. well, that, that's true. <laughs> no, no. I'm I think taking a shot at your house. No, no, no. <laughs> but I think I think that's great feedback and continue to you know provide that to the group because stuff like that is what yeah. we want to hear for, especially for the for the growing areas. Yep. Uh, yeah. No, that was a started. really good proactive idea to poll the, oh. the users and well, put that list together. Not a hard thing to do. I wish I would have got hundreds of responses, right. but <laughs> I did get enough responses to give us some yeah. things mm -hmm. to think about. You know, this is this is on the uh, it's on the radar for the whole this community in the region, mm -hmm. right? Not, not just the local yeah. community. So. Well, like I was telling you before we started the meeting, yeah. this past Saturday it was so packed there, the parking lot was almost full. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it just gives you, here we are in December, a beautiful day, everybody yeah. comes out, right? So yeah. it's uh, it definitely is getting a lot of focus and interest. Best make it destination worthy. Mm -hmm. a, a I, I did talk to Dave Cobb today, and they said their next plan is to try to put the flags on top of the, um, I see that they put the, the brooms out on most of the holes. Yeah. I want to say most. I don't know if all of them are. I haven't go. Che I haven't checked it out yet, but um, they're going to work on putting the flags on each of the baskets. Yeah, so that'll... that's their next semi little project. Something else for me to hit and not go in the basket. <laughs> Stop it from going Perfect. further. <laughs> Stop it from going further. Maybe yeah. That's <laughs> good point. Thanks, Tim. Yep. And then just the last uh, one we're carrying. We brought up last month. Yeah. Uh, idea of adding a sign yeah real quick I, yeah just real quick i did email parrington they got back to me they would like to take our lead on that they are very interested so we would have to come up with a design size and then i would email that size over to them and so that we can match and do like a back-to-back -back right. type of metal sign That's welcome right. to penfield welcome to this trail so yeah. um i'm working on a semi simple design um so. And then I'll share it with us or the email group if we want to push it forward. And then I'll send it over to Parrington to see what they think so so we can match. Excellent. Very nice. Yeah. Okay. No old business. Um, new business. One quick thing. Uh, Joel yeah. found this map. And I, will, I scanned it in this afternoon. I will email it out. Mm -hmm. It says Trials Master Plan. It's dated 2003-2014. I'm not sure who did it. Hmm. But I will... Send it out. It's got some interesting lines on it about different trails, such as trails. So, um, so like I said, I'll, e I'll email out. Yeah, I'll check with Joel. <laughs> it's good input. Cool. That's great for the master plan yeah. update. The, yeah. yeah, sounds good. Uh, no one here from the public, so I think um, with that, our next meeting is January 9th, and adjourned. Happy holidays, all.